and welcome to another very special episode of The Robust Marketer. I'm Eric Dick, CEO and co-founder of iStack Training, and we're having another one of our conversations with uh, e-commerce all-stars here in Atlanta, Georgia. We're in a, in a fabulous mansion here uh, discussing some really relevant stuff going on with e-commerce today. Uh, so today I'm really lucky to have a friend of mine uh, and someone that I'm really excited to be doing some, some exciting things with. We've got Ben Malal. So many of you guys will know Ben Malal from his Facebook group, from his so social media presence. Um, he is a sort of well-known Facebook marketing expert. He's helped uh, many different companies scale six, seven, even eight figures at times uh, out of his agency, essentially. And uh, you know, he's, he's been featured in Forbes and CBS. He's always on his mom's Facebook, as he likes to say. Uh, he's, uh, he's an excellent guy. He's here to talk to us about Facebook ads, what he's known for, but also beyond that, I think a big thing that goes underlooked uh, in, in social media marketing today is the entire creative funnel. Uh, and so that's something that I'm really excited to be here talking about Ben with. He's a super creative guy. Uh, and uh, so welcome to the robust marketer here, Ben Malal. Welcome Thanks, aboard. Ben. Thanks for having me, dude. What an intro. Wow. I feel uh, I, think I gotta live up to, that, to those standards now. Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, I've known you for a while. I know you've, you've handled a bunch of cool projects. Right. Um, I, just give us your, you know, we did that interview before where we mm -hmm. talked a little bit, but give, for people who may not have seen that, let's just do, give a recap of, of how you got to where you are today. Right. Um, so yeah, first of all, as you guys know, my name is Ben Malal. I've actually gotten into internet marketing back when I was 16, but never really successful with it. Just playing around with it as a hobby, eBay, Amazon. Nothing really substantial. I got deep into it about three, four years ago when I got into the e-commerce dropshipping game, as people know today, Shopify, AliExpress. And that's where I first started my internet marketing journey. Um, started a few stores, was successful, but I really loved the Facebook advertising side of it, the marketing side of it more than anything else. So that's why I really transitioned and started first of all building my personal brand around that, which actually, um, it, it built up as sort of a mistake, not a mistake, but I wasn't intending of building a personal brand. I was just like producing a lot of content to people in groups and slowly more and more people would follow me and then suddenly I have a personal brand as, as you might call it. I transitioned that into more of a Facebook ad side, analytics, marketing, because that's what I really have passion for, which eventually grown, um, has changed to my agency, my Facebook advertising course, Facebook, um, Facebook advertising presence, as you call it, and my e-commerce brands, I rely heavily on the social media marketing aspect of it. Even in my current businesses and my e-commerce businesses, I don't really deal with the e-commerce side, I'm just like the marketing guy. So that's how I came to be where I am, starting from e-commerce dropshipping to eventually developing my Facebook advertising skill to social media skills, to now really focusing uh, on social media marketing as an essence. Nice, so I wanna give the audience a real like a context to start with about, about your expertise Tell me a little bit about what your day looks like. T tell me like a heavy day in your sort of uh, social media agency, like what that looks like. Because I know you've got multiple different projects going on, right. lots of irons in the fire, working with different teams. Give me an idea, as it relates to Facebook ads, what does your day look like? Right, now in all honesty, my days are super unorganized. Uh, it's something I'm working on. But due to me actually being part of a, little, a lot of projects, including e-commerce stores, agency, education, and some projects I'm marketing manager on, my day usually consists of at this point is managing the teams and less putting in the nitty gritty. Yeah. Actually, a lot of my time is, is around the design and the stories behind the marketing that I do on top of actually running the ads and giving guidance to my team on how to run the ads. So essentially, my, my, uh, my day will sometimes be split from me working on my agency and uh, working on the clients to being part of projects and running ads to the projects to focusing on the store. Today, I try to outsource as many things as possible. And by outsourcing, I'm not talking about really getting like VAs, which we have, but more outsourcing and getting executives and making sure that the company is organized and working in a specific route and has a very, very aligned vision. Now, all of the things that I'm actually working on are aligned to one uh, purpose at the end, which is to bring more social media marketing uh, to the world in a more entertaining way and less of a, like a salesy Facebook ads, like a front end by this way. You know, so that's, that's usually how I structure my day of like seeing what's highest value and then focusing on that and more of the vision and pushing the vision forward and just going into the nitty gritty of stuff. Gotcha. Uh, and you, you, you mentioned there this idea of, uh, you know, the Facebook ads actually getting it out there as well as what we're calling the creative funnel essentially. Right. And the ideas behind. And so we'll get into that aspect, but let's start with Facebook. Facebook is uh, an essential skill, you know, th that, yeah, th that everyone needs uh, in e-commerce. It's the essential marketing tool. There's lots of ways to supplement. There's lots of different ways to take it, mm -hmm. but you have to master Facebook ads. So my first question is, is Facebook ads dead? <laughs> it's a good question, and the answer <laughs> is it actually is dead. 
No, oh. I'm just kidding. Damn it, what are we, that's where, let's get out of here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's over. It's over. Oh, uh, cut. But uh, yeah, so essentially Facebook ads, a lot of people see it as like dead or like, it's not as it used to be. And that's right, it is not as it used to be. And that's how the world is. With marketing, things change. Something that worked three years ago doesn't work today. Something that worked even a year ago doesn't work today. Heck, even something that we used to do three months ago isn't as effective today. And that's just how the world evolves. With Facebook ads, in an essence, it's a traffic source. That's what people don't understand. It's not a way to make money. It's not like I'm making money with Facebook ads. It's not that people that do Facebook ads are making money with that. They're sending traffic into something that they're making money with or building a business around. What changed is the fact that there is more saturation in the market, which means that costs are more expensive. And that's not essentially a bad thing. That just means that there needs to be a bit more knowledge and, and you have to approach it in less of a, um, a quick money, fast cash type way and more of like, a CEO and a businessman. You have to treat Facebook ads not only as a traffic source, but what are you trying to accomplish and what type of traffic you want to bring. You know, it's not only about like running ads to this product or or that that's it, and then like let's see how much money comes in. A good example will be that uh, as you know, and uh, a lot of people do, I uh, I run like the Facebook ads group, which has like over forty five thousand people, and I run like my student groups and stuff that have thousands of people. And the questions that I always always get constantly is. They post a screenshot of like their ads and like, why isn't my stuff working? I'm getting this and this cost per click. I'm getting this and this. Why, why isn't this working? Is, am I not targeting ter- correctly? Am I not optimizing correctly? The first question I ask them is not about even the Facebook ad. It's about show me your product, show me your store, show me your funnel. 90% of the time, nine out of 10 times, the product is usually complete shit. I'm not even joking. It's so bad that you open it up on mobile. It's not even about product. It's not even about the product. It's about the whole website. I'll go in, I'll open the product page that they're running traffic to on my mobile phone. First thing is, half of the screen is the logo. Second thing is, there's pop-ups coming in from every sector. Wheelio, gamifying, opting in, (laughs) discounts, coupons. They just hit a checklist. I don't even see see the product because all of the pop-ups. Facebook ads is not the problem here, is that your product and funnel, you're not not sending people to something that, that, that even can sell. So Facebook ads is an external source of your actual business. So to answer your question in a nutshell, Facebook ads is not dead and it would actually never be dead unless Facebook is dead, which would never happen how Mark Zuckerberg is pushing his companies. But Facebook has just changed, you know, in the good and the bad. It's closing its door to lower quality experiences. Pretty much. Right? Uh, Lower quality customer experiences, lower quality store experiences. That's what is happening. So the answer is obvious. Facebook isn't dead, right? but businesses always need to evolve and they're evolving for the better because of this stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So you just have to, yeah, I I think... uh, that's pretty crystal clear. Right. Uh, and that's a really interesting point you bring up about the, the 90 10. It's probably higher than that. You know, like 90% of stores are, are just not thinking about their, their experience or their strategy. They're sort exactly. of like their overall strategy, their creative strategy, their creative funnel. And, and so, but the thing is, there are Facebook hacks. There are things that you yeah. need to know. There are ways to manipulate it and ways to, uh, you know, for scale, ways to not manipulate it, but ways to get scale and get volume and yeah, get sales. It's an algorithmic platform. At the yeah. end of the day, there's ways to utilize it in better and worse and ways. And there's always, so people who are doing it all the time are going to be better because it's always changing. Exactly. Uh, and, so, and so it's something you, you do have to engage in, but it's almost not worth engaging uh, until you've really put some good thought into, into your, your creative funnel, as we say, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's the main essence of it. Nice. So uh, just quickly, let's, so I'm going to bring it back to the nitty gritty for a second on right, Facebook. Right, yeah, like, sure. What are some of the key things that have changed six months ago? Is it really, is it just about that customer experience? Like, what are some practical things of the ways it's changed in the past six months? Right. So Facebook are not treating um, the Facebook advertising platform in more, they're, they're putting, pushing a lot of user experience, a lot of user experience. And I've actually been on the news in like uh, Weekend Sunrise in Australia yes, and like CBS actually talking about this. Uh, when like the big, there was a big talk about like Zuckerberg where he's, I don't exactly remember the nitty gritty, but the whole privacy, not talking about like the Cambridge Analytica aspect, but the fact is like how you're changing the whole advertising and pushing more user experience, which basically means if, you're, if your business or your ads are not only compliant, which has always been like that, but they have to actually be, give out good content, then Facebook will not treat you as well and you will not actually get customers as well. So the main difference is, is first of all, this is a natural difference where there's more advertisers, so costs are more expensive. Yep. So the biggest difference is costs are more expensive. And by costs, I basically mean that you're paying more to basically get traffic. So if a year ago or two years ago, you would pay, let's say, $10 to get 3,000 people in first world countries to see your ad, today you're probably paying $10 to get 1,000 people. To see, um, to see your ads, which is good and bad. Because number one, the thing is, is that if, less, if, if ads are more expensive, that means that you have to have a higher customer value. And if you have, need to have a higher customer value, you have to build a legitimate business, which 
people will see that as a bad thing, but I see that as a good thing because now you have the option to actually build a sustainable brand that won't make you $100,000 in two months, but will make you much more in the long term because you're actually putting in business aspects and treating it as a CEO. Yeah. So that's one of the main aspects. The other aspect is that Facebook wants you to produce actual good content because now they're showing less ads on your newsfeed. I think if I remember correctly, it used to be like one ad out of like five posts, in the organic posts, today it might be like one out of 10 posts, mm -hmm. which means people are seeing less ads. Now that's a good thing and a bad thing. One, the ads are essentially more expensive, but two, people, potential customers react more positively to these ads because they see less of them. Yeah. Which means, yes, you'll be paying more for ads, but these customers are be, gonna be worth more because they're not used to seeing ads. So that's really the main changes that Zuckerberg and like Facebook actually introduced to the market, putting more on the user experience rather than just like pushing in traffic and like sending ads and selling whatever you want. Yeah. So when it comes to methodologies, uh, methodologies, sorry, of, uh, of of actually testing and scaling Facebook ads, what like you don't don't give me your your strategies, right? But, but but just talk about your sort of philosophy for for doing that. Are you a very systematic person? Like I know you're an interesting kind of person because you've got this creative side, right? Uh, where you're thinking very creatively about the brand, but you're also very data. You know that's a really yeah. good good way to be essentially. Exactly. So what what is what, talk about your methodology overall for both so with, for testing and scaling Facebook ads? Right, right. It's a great question. Uh, great question. Now the thing is, it's not, a, it's not essentially contradicting it's a, each other, it's actually empowering each other. Now my mythology with Facebook is that there's two routes to take. Facebook ads can be a traffic source of how you basically build a brand and push it forward into building something that is not essentially only reliant on Facebook ads, but then there's another side of Facebook ads where you're building a store or a pop-up shop or just like an offer and then running uh, Facebook ads and traffic to that offer. And you can only rely on Facebook ads, which is completely fine, we still do that today, right? Those two mythologies are, if we're going on the churn and burn or like the fast uh, make money type thing, it's essentially, um, I can't go as deep because that would be like three hours, but in a nutshell, and most people that actually have experienced Facebook ads will understand this, is I test a lot of different angles with an auto bid campaign essentially, right? I run 10, $20 a day ads on different angles and targeting. Let's say I have a specific product and I wanna run traffic to it. Let's just take, for example, a dog product, right? So I'll be targeting dog interests, right? But uh, it depends how much money I want to put in and invest into actually testing it. I can be testing five different audiences and putting like an auto bid, $20 on each one of those audiences. That will essentially result in $100 a day because 20 times five is 100. Or I can invest less and only put one ad and combine all the audiences. Now I'll usually scale any ad that is auto bid that is giving me a profitable return on investment after two, three days. Uh, and by profitable return on investment, of course, I mean that I'm making more after expenses of advertising and after cost of goods. So if I'm sending a $20 a dog leash or whatever, and I'm, I'm, I need $10 to even buy the product, and I'm paying $5 on, on, to get a purchase through ads, I'm not left with $5 profit. So if I'm left with profit after two, three days, I usually scale it. Now there's a million different ways to scale. So don't take this as ab obsolete what I'm about to say because there's a lot of different ways to do the same thing and they're not, there's not like some of them are bad, some of them are good, they're different routes. How I do it is I just run very big uh, ad set budgets where like $1,000, $2,000 a day with a manual bid. And a manual bid for me is less, I, I don't treat it as a manual bid, I actually call it budget control because I can put $1,000, $2,000 but if the bid is correctly, I will only spend a specific percentage of that manual bid uh, budget depending on the bid that I'm actually putting on it. So if I'm putting a $2,000 budget, but I'm bidding on like $20 cost per purchase, then the ads maybe one day will only spend $300 out of that $2,000, and another day will spend $800. Maybe another day won't spend anything at all. But it's more controlled and it's more sustainable. And on top of that, that's the way uh, I basically push numbers like higher. I test on the, uh, the um, audience level a lot, and whatever works, I'll duplicate that, completely the same targeting, and I will target A. Manual, I will do the same thing but with manual bid. Of course, there's a lot of different testing structures. Sometimes I'll, today I even went to 10 different um, audience segments, which includes USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK, first world country Europe, um, third world country Europe, Asia, top tier Asia, low tier Asia, literally 10 different segments, South Africa, and then I test those 10 different segments and then suddenly, because people, this is another thing that this is like a golden nugget that, uh, about Facebook ads that people don't understand. They go straight to USA and Canada. And you'll be surprised that from the past year, the, the audience, the, the countries that worked for us the most, like 90, maybe 80% of the time, were actually not USA and Canada. Sometimes it would be South America, sometimes it would be Asia, sometimes it would be Australia. And I'll tell you exactly why as well. In the US, let's say for example, we have a 5% conversion rate, okay? Um, but we're paying about $30, $30 CPM, which we're paying $30 to actually show our ad to 1,000 people. Okay. But we have a 5% conversion rate. 
But let's say we're targeting Mexico. Okay, and our conversion rate is only 2%, lower than the US, but we're paying $3 to show our ad to 1,000 people, which essentially means we're paying a tenth of the price that we're paying for the US to show our ads, but our conversion rates are only half. Yep. So essentially, Mexico will bring us much more money because we're paying much less, but the conversion rate together with how much we're paying to show our ads to the audience eventually adds up to bring us more revenue. So don't only focus on for first world. We actually even, our testing isn't, sometimes we don't even start with USA, Canada. We'll go in and target like third world if our product is cheap. And then you'll notice all of these different changes. But don't be strict on USA, Canada, Australia in the top five. A quick tip as well, and I'll, I'll close this question is, go and search the top 25 GDP countries in Google, and those should be your, your countries that you want to target. Mm -hmm. Those include a lot of European countries that are, uh, because at the end of the day, USA is as rich as the Netherlands, but the Netherlands is much cheaper traffic. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's funny just using GDP as a metric, because I know right. a lot, you try to eyeball it a lot. People will try to be like, oh, that country, that country, that country, but yeah, you, you yeah. miss ones that you, you know, exactly, don't yeah. give Latvia enough respect, you know? Right, essentially, yeah, <laughs> dude, who says Latvia doesn't have a few people that want to buy dog collars, Yeah, you know? and exactly. the e-commerce e trend is growing globally, so it's those emerging markets are going to be massive opportunities yeah, for yeah. people. Exactly. Very cool. So, yeah, you've given a lot of, like, sort of inside insight into, into scaling, testing, things like that. But talk a little bit more you know, about the other aspect that, that, that we've talked a lot about, which is the, the creative funnel. So, so basically starting with how your brand, uh, starting with your brand, then how your brand appears to customers usually through social media, Facebook ads, through to the landing page. Like what, what's your sort of philosophy on the creative funnel essentially? Good, good, yeah. Um, so basically you gotta understand why do people actually buy products? Now there's a few, there's a few, there's a few different people. First of all, Sometimes people will buy a product just because they need the product. Okay, if it's like a kitchen tool, right? If it cuts a cucumber fast, and oh cool, it's a cucumber slicer, I need that. I slice cucumbers. Right, that's all, that's all you need. They, sometimes people don't really care about the brand of the cucumber slicer. You know, if yeah. it's a $10 or $100 cucumber slicer, they'll probably buy the $10 one. But on the other aspect, there's products that people don't buy, they essentially the product, but they buy the story or brand behind the product. That's what you see with apparel a lot. That's why Louis Vuitton, people buy a $1,000. I'll leave it on yep. shirts. That's why people buy a $40,000 Rolex watch, you know, because they see the story behind the brand. Totally. And that's essentially the route that you, that uh, those are the two different routes. No, there's not one or good, uh, one that's good or bad, there's just two different routes. Now the story, the, what, I'm, what we're actually talking about with the creative funnel side is that try to imagine this as you're selling a product, but you're not only selling the product, you're selling a story behind it. So you can be selling a shirt or a ring or a specific piece of jewelry, and you can buy it for $3 from AliExpress, but you can sell it for $10, or you can even sell it for $300, depending on what you have behind it. Now, a good way to actually showcase this is look at websites that just have a bunch of random general products, and a website that has a very, very optimized website. The pictures look HD, the website is optimized, it looks good, there's a story behind it. Let's say your hat, right? Now you have this hat, it's an iStack Sick training hat. hat. Yeah. Let's say, uh, let's say iStack was a global brand, okay? Uh, like multi-billion dollar brand. Okay, which will, it will probably get yeah, there in, get the, next, there. Oh, in yeah. the next week or two, yeah. right? <laughs> but yeah, let's say it's a multi-billion dollar brand. Now let's say somebody sees that and it's like, oh cool, that's a cool hat. Now on a general store where there's like a bunch of random products like pillows and hats and maybe like some statues, you can sell that hat for $10, yeah. right? But let's say we're, we're gonna take that same exact hat and we're gonna create an entire store around that hat. We're gonna talk about the specifics of it. We're gonna have a zoom in on like the material. We're gonna talk about the quality, the weight of it, yep. show testimonials of that hat. The, the site is so optimized and like it's, 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 it looks literally like a piece of art. Yeah. You could probably sell a hat for $500 and it's the exact same hat. The only difference is that here you're just like trying to sell the hat, but on the other one, you're not really trying to sell the hat, you're trying to sell the story yeah. behind the hat. That's like Swatch, right? Like the famous story of that is Swatch. Swatch, Swatch right. watches came out and they, they're, they're the cheapest watches to make mm -hmm. and they were selling them for 15 bucks or something like that and nobody exactly. wanted them. They're like, it was these zany. Then all of a sudden they started putting them in glass cases in an all white exactly. storeroom yeah. and everything like that and they bumped the price up to $100 and right. that's what they became exactly. worth to people. Apple, Apple do the same thing. Movement have actually started a cool thing as well. And another example that I can give you is uh, like one of our e-commerce brands, we're relying on a lot of our sales and our traffic, not essentially from sending people to the product page, but from creating viral videos. Now the thing about a viral video is that if you create a viral video, that the purpose of it, other than brand awareness, is that you're getting a lot of very cheap CPMs. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is that, let's say we're running an ad, just a front-end product ad. You have every dollar that you pay is going on advertising. People aren't really sharing it. You know? So if you're paying, uh, you're paying like, uh, let's say a dollar to show it to, to 1,000 people, then you have a dollar CPM, right? You're paying $10 to show it to 1,000 people, your CPM is at $10. People are not sharing or commenting because it's just a, basically a product. They, they, they see it, they don't see a reason to share it, they're just like either buy or not buy. But if you create a viral video 
around the product. And by viral, I mean it can be entertaining or co comedic or people really react well to it. Mm -hmm. They'll have an incentive to share. Now, if we create a viral video and let's say one out of every three people share our video, that essentially means that we're going to pay the CPM, regular CPM on actually showing this, this um, ad to people, but we're going to get another 33% free CPM on all the people that share it. Yeah. And actually, it's beyond that because the second somebody shares the video, it's exposed to thousands of their friends. So on a regular product, I'll be paying a dollar for, let's say $10 to reach 1,000 people. On a viral video, I might be paying 50 cents to show it to a thousand people because of how many times it's shared. And it's self-fulfilling because fa every time it's shared, Facebook is giving you a thumbs up towards, much, you know, yeah. your, your cost could potentially come exactly. down the more, the more people right, love right, your right. content too. So that's how, that's how we look at it and that's how a lot of people should look at it. When you actually create viral content and you create like something that people have an incentive to share, in the end of the day, yeah, you're creating brand awareness, but in simple terms, you're just getting free advertising because of people sharing it and commenting and share, like showing it to their friends and stuff. Yeah. So there's a lot of different aspects with it, but once you start to look at it as more of an art form and less of a way to make money, that's where you're gonna grow a business from even making $100,000 a month to making $10 million a month, for example. Now, talk about the actual creative architecture. Like, is, is carpet bombing still the thing to do? Are people still really um, throwing out like a, t a ton of video content and then you know, measuring 75% of the people who watch that mm -hmm. or 75% of the time and, and then and going in that way. Like what's the actual way that you find in terms of ad formats that work best right. for e-commerce products? So carpet bombing is a good example of like a way to kind of not hack the system, but a way to explain the system very well to people. Because if you go and we, we target people that watch 75% of the video, that's already a warm audience. So you're kind of doing a brand awareness type thing by doing that. Even with these viral videos that I just talked about, like we're doing that. Funnel. Exactly. Um, even with the viral videos I just talked about, we're doing that as an, in essence to create audiences that we can target of video viewers. Now, the creative side of it, of course, is changes from business to business to business. But the main aspect of it is to create a story behind the product. So we can take the hat again for an, an example. You can have a, a, an image of the hat, right? Or you can have a video of the hat where the video shows people wearing it. It shows zoom ins, zoom outs, high quality definition images. You know, the copy isn't essentially uh, do you love this cool hat? Make sure to get it now, 30% off. Use discount hat now in the checkout. Cool, some people will like the hat and want to buy it for 10 bucks and get 30% off, buy it for $7. Or if we had a longer form copy with some humor, com comedy, pain points in it with a dope ass video. Like for example, it's called like iStack Training, right? So let's say iStack Training was a type of, uh, of, of a brand that is uh, about stacking in the philosophy. There's, a, there's stacking called in, uh, in oh, NLP. Oh, there's a philosophy of stacking, yeah. 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 So um, yeah, I'm sure it's actually related to that. <laughs> so let's say in the, in the ad, it would be like, have you ever, like the first headline would be, have you ever heard about stacking your emotions? Question mark. People are like, hmm, what's that? We want to welcome you to the world of iStack training. Get your hat to join the movement. This hat is made out of 75% content, uh, let's say 5% content, 10% uh, 10 polyester, and 85% epicness. And 100% value. And 100% value, and <laughs> stuff like that. With a video that really showcases the, 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 the actual hat. So there's no essential, like you can never answer the question of how to make a brand or a creative site in like one answer. Yeah. That's the thing, it doesn't have an answer. The answer, like it's very spiritual to say it, but the answer comes from within in a way. Like I'll treat a million different brands in a million different, different ways, but the essence stays the same. Create a story, understand the value, and push the value and that's the product. Push the story, push the push the, the story and the team and like whatever the essence is, and not the actual hat. Like for example, one of my agencies that uh, uh, MFM that I showed you, it really really focuses on the team and that's about what you're gonna we're gonna do for your business. You know, as you saw, like the website is very very simple, but the team is so insane and we the the way that the team pages visualizes that every person has a full on full screen intro and bio with yep. images. You know, so people see that. And at the end of the day, you want to hire a marketing agency, not because they have a cool website and because they, they say that we're going to do this for you, this for you, this for you. Because what is, what is an agency or what is any company that does service? It's about the team. Yep. So that's why we're pushing that. And your experience as you know, badass internet marketers, because there's a lot of agencies out there right. that haven't come natively to digital exactly. and then aren't going to have this, this sort of cutting edge mm -hmm. skill. So I see right. that being... So start, start actually, people need to start looking at that. And I'll give another tip, by the way, of how to structure your mind to actually think on these levels. Because it's something that you can't really learn from a course just like that. You can learn some tips and tricks to do stuff like this, like different copy techniques or video techniques. But the best way that we actually focused on is we're very involved in the world and trends and stuff like that. Like we're very involved. Like as, as unproductive as it is, we watch 
new movies. You yeah. know, if it's the Avengers, if it's like trends that come on, if it's a cryptocurrency that we saw, we're very involved in what's going on with YouTube, with the world, with the economy, with if it's pol um, politics or or whatever, we're involved in it because this teaches us how the world is responding to different things, and then we leverage that. So like with cryptocurrency, um, we leveraged that and did like a full-on campaign around cryptocurrency with Donald Trump. We actually created a campaign around the Donald Trump controversy, funny shirts and stuff like that. And the reason it was so successful is because it was on a trend. If we would have created the Donald Trump campaign now, it would probably not work as good because we played on the trend. It's about understanding what people want and, and really finding the timing correctly. And sort of it's a way of like you're in their mind. If you're showing things that are trending right now and leveraging them in, in ads, essentially, right. you're, it's sort of like a, it's an inception, right? Because it's like, that's on my mind already. Here's mm -hmm. a new take on that. Here's a right. brand that's associated with that. Exactly. I see that being a, a really yeah. cool creative tip. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Very, very That's like cool. another route to take. It's not essentially related to the brand aspect, yeah. but people can just like leverage trends, you know? So you gotta take this whole creative funnel into mind, and then you gotta learn the nitty gritty like tactics of exactly. testing and scaling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, 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 that's, and that's a really good way to do it. So do you think, can you build a business alone on, uh, you know, on Facebook ads? Do you think it's a wise idea to, fo to, to build a full business on Facebook ads? Mm -hmm. and, and like, uh, it's funny, we did a survey recently and I think, I think probably it was 75% of the people uh, of our e-commerce survey said 80% of their advertising budget or more was, was on Facebook ads. So right. a lot of people are, are getting by on, like you can get by on yeah, Facebook yeah, ads. Yeah, definitely. What are, what are your thoughts on, on that? Definitely, like if you can build a business completely reliant on Facebook ads, of course you can. Is it suggested? It depends what your values are, what you want to do. Do you want? Do you just want to make some money? Go, go run some Facebook ads for a store. Like people have been doing stuff that are very, very fast cash for years, like affiliate marketing, black hat stuff. And there's, they, I know people that have been doing this since 1995. You know, they change their marketing every time, but they're still doing the fast cash thing. Yep. And they're multi, multi millionaires. But and they, they don't go from one trend to another. One, yeah, one. But thing. they understand that. They yeah. understand that the market is evolving, and they know that okay, it's dead now. Let's move to the other thing. Okay, this is dead now. We're going to the other thing. And it's not like anything of these things are dead. It's just like the marketing store, the marketing strategies behind these aspects are dead. So Facebook ads, in a way, is not dead. Just the marketing way to approach Facebook ads. That that was like three years ago is dead in a way. Yeah. You know, Facebook ads is still is still like a huge market. If it was dead, you won't be seeing advertising. Yeah. Now, to answer the question, how I actually see it is, the why is it so popular is because there was a big big surge in uh, internet marketing industries in the past few years, and as you know, like ten years ago, for example, it was still pretty big, but it wasn't as big as today. And Facebook ads was the first thing. Facebook ads, Shopify. It's more, it's not even less about Facebook ads, it's more of the Shopify trend that started like a few years back, which I got into it um, when I actually started. But the thing is, is that it was so easy when it got started that people got so used to it that they didn't see a reason to actually build a legitimate business. They didn't even know what it means to have a legitimate business. They thought that this is a business. Yeah. Running ads to a Shopify store is a business. I don't need anything else, Google, YouTube, fuck that, only Facebook ads. And that's the worked. problem. And it worked. Yeah. And again, it still works today. It's a bit yeah. more difficult. But because people were so used to that, that's why you suddenly see people falling off because advertising costs are getting more expensive. Yep. Customer value isn't getting more higher because people are very, very involved in only drop shipping. Then suddenly they're not, um, they're not profitable as much because they have to pay too much money to get a purchase. Now, so there's two routes to take with this. It's a great learning ground, testing ground, training ground, but have a higher vision and understand that be aware that it's a trend or like be aware that this is a way to supplement something that you want to build in the future. That's how you should approach it. Very cool. Right. So I think we can also announce here, we've got uh, Ben Malal also is involved in e-commerce all-star secrets. We've got Ben on board uh, for our six part mini course to teach uh, basically an, an, an overview of, of some of his Facebook methods as well as, as some more stuff about, about creative. Uh, super excited to have him involved and you know, Again, if we were rounding up the, you know, the Avengers of, of e-commerce here, the all-stars, we have our uh, Captain Ecom with Nick Peroni. Uh, if you had to be an Avenger, what, uh, what would you pick, do you think? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Iron Man is pretty cool, but I, I don't like Iron Man as much as like Tony Stark. You know, he seems like a cool, cool ass dude. I'll probably be Tony Stark. Well, then I guess that would have to make you uh, Tony Scale in this case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. You got Scale Industries. Uh, he'll that be is, that's true. Showing the, both the, the social, creative, and Facebook nitty gritty, which is the most exactly. I've ever said nitty gritty in an right. interview. I still want to have an Iron Man suit, though. Uh, we're going to get you a gummy man <laughs> suit, I okay. think. I'll uh, be fine with that. But we're super excited for, for the cool stuff we're doing with uh, Ben this summer. You can catch him at ECML as well. Uh, live in Barcelona on stage. Uh, he told me that we're going to have a rave after, so we will. Uh, I, I'm very excited about that. Uh, but thanks for coming by my yeah. mansion today. 
And uh, I wasn't able to make you cry on my Oprah couch, but uh, I've still got one and more interview we still to have, do we still that have today. A few, so a few more days, don't worry. I'm we'll gonna get make there. it go. Okay, cheers, brother. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah.